that I've created all of those, we'll start to drag and drop them on top of each other to create our hierarchy. So in our text file here, we had process, operation, and equipment. So we now have process, and then we need to add operations to our processes to build that part of the tree. So if we have a case pack, it's going to belong to case packing. If we have a chill, that belongs to the process. The heating belongs to process. Mixing, obviously to mixing. And to unit packing, we move to the unit packing process. Now if we have a look at our hierarchy, things are starting to make a little bit more sense. We have plant.line1 dot line one unit packing process has a line one unit packing operation and the operation is going to be performed using a piece of equipment so let's move on to doing that we're going to start with our case packer that belongs to the case packing operation uh, yeah case packer equipment belongs to the the operation of case pack the chiller belongs to the chill operation Heater belongs to the heat operation. Mixer belongs to the mix operation. And now we have one left, the unit pack operation, which has three flow wrappers. So we can drag these three times. I missed a one, unit packing. It must be very noticeable when you're watching the video if you're paying attention. You must catch that faster than I do. Okay, now we have plant.line1, line one case packing process, performs the operation to pack a case using the equipment case packer. This gives us our hierarchical model of everything that we need in order to build our, uh, our process in, in the virtual world. Our, um, our line in the virtual world. So if we look at this under the model hierarchy, we start to see this will look very much more like the model we saw in the text file. Here we have line one, line one. If we minimize all of these, you'll see that we have a P these aren't in alph these are in al alphabetical order and these ones aren't so you'll have to figure these are in mu much more logical order you could prefix these with a one two three four for example to put them in the order you wish um, that's something you could do I generally don't bother um, we have first case packing this one we have for the process case packing we have process mixing up here we have process process here and then unit packing and then inside Unit packing, for example, we should have one operation and then we should have three pieces of equipment. So if we open up the unit packing process, we have one operation, three flow wrappers. So this looks perfect. It looks exactly like what we're expecting to see. Let's now have a look at the deployment model. These have not been assigned to a host. Let's move these over to the application engine. I think that looks pretty good. Let's deploy our application engine. Let's not deploy all the child objects because it takes forever. In this case, it, if you've got a very large galaxy, you can also have problems when you try and deploy too much in one hit, particularly if you're doing the actual galaxy repository deployment at the same time. So it's worth doing this one first and then we can push the entire application engine and all its um, children processes and, and equipment and operations. I'll pause this and we'll, okay, I won't have to pause this. Now let's deploy our application engine and all its children. Forgive the woodworking sounds in the background if you can hear those, that's my next door neighbours. In, uh, in Australia at the moment, we're in partial lockdown due to the corona COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, a lot of us are working from home, me included, which is why I can knock off from normal work hours and do this for you. 
Excellent. Let's just deploy our view engine, even though there's nothing there for us to actually use at this point. View engine deployed. To give you an idea of performance, this is a virtual machine running off an SSD on an i7 laptop with 32 gigs of RAM. So system platform's fairly processor and memory intensive, but it's not too bad when your system, your galaxy is not, not massive yet. So this is now should be running on our application engine. So if we were to pick uh, a piece of equipment at the lowest level, uh, because that's the lowest level in our hierarchy, and we were to view an object viewer, we can see the hierarchy that's on our application engine, and we can see that our uh, flow wrapper one being selected has you know, a fully qualified path name all the way down to the bottom. One of the other things we could do is just add a couple of sensors and valves and things. At this point, they're probably not going to be massively useful. Um, however, later on when we do our sample results, we might want to have sensor readings or valve positions and things in our, in our scheduled or sample um, that we generate with MES. So let's put a few of those in. We're going to need a motor, a valve, heater, chiller, and glue applicator. I want a ceiling element. Okay, I'll put these on my other screen so that I can see all of them because that's going to be too much for my little mind to remember. Let's go to our derivation view. These are, as we discussed before, these are instances of areas uh, from this area root, and that gives you the alarm aggregation and the other options we were talking about. Right down to the individual devices, like a motor or a glue applicator, they're virtual in this case anyway, they don't actually exist. But in the context of a plant, you might have an error when a motor fails to perform, but you're never going to want to aggregate your alarms to count how many motor alarms you have at the motor level, or how many alarms you have at the motor level. You might want to know how many at a case pack error are not working, but you're not going to want to know how many individual motor alarms you have. So if you've got a over torque, over temperature, and they're all based on the same motor, you're not going to want to group those together. You're just going to look at that motor and go, okay, motor one's got a problem. Um, you might drill into it and look at those tags later, but you're not going to aggregate those up and then want to see those at a higher level. That's just a level of, of detail that you don't need. Um, in your application, you might want to go five, six, seven layers deep, but for us, we're not going to at this point. Let's create a user defined, control shift N, A, A, uh, sorry, A user defined, control shift N, AB user defined and control N. We're going to make ourselves. Actually, we're not going to. Let's press escape. I'm going to delete that. Now we're going to make our individual instances for our device types. So we're going to have motor or valve. Oh, it's called a sealer. Heater. Chiller. We've got two uh, motor and two valves on the mixer. So let's take the mixer equipment, press F2. Copy that into our clipboard, and we're going to say Control N, an instance of a motor, and it's going to be the Line 1 Equipment Mixer Motor 1. Now this has two valves, so we're going to Control N, VV or V01. New. O2. You can see why I'm doing this to give them unique prefixes. This way System Platform doesn't complain about their lack of uniqueness. When it comes to their contained names later up, later on when we drop them in the hierarchy, we'll simplify them to V1, V2 so that the name of the tag isn't so long. You'll see that process in just a moment. So while we're in the valve section, we don't have any more valves. 
well, I'll go back up to the motor section. We need a motor for each one of our flow wrappers. So let's go control N, flow wrapper one, MO one. New flow wrapper two, MO one. It's the first motor on each one of these devices. Whoops, I put the wrong thing in the clipboard. Nope. I put the right thing, I just reordered them, never mind. Control N for new, paste, flare wrapper 3, M01. Now we have three motors, we need a, an M01 for our case packer. M01. Now we just need a heater chiller and three sealing elements grab our equipment name again. So the ceiling elements have nothing other than motors. So let's create motors and motors and ceiling elements, sorry. M01. Oh, sorry. I've already created those ones. That's a bit silly. So we have a case packer and the flow wrappers have got their own motors. They're the unit packers. And we have the mixer motor, so that's all the motors we need. Now we have ceiling elements times three. One, two, and three for flow wrappers, one, two, and three. So control N. SEO one for ceiling element. I just made that up. I don't know what a ceiling element is. Two SEO one. It's the first one on each of the flow wrappers. New instance SE01. That's all our ceiling elements. Now we just need a chiller element and a heating element. And I think we're good. Control N. The chiller belongs to equipment. Chiller. Let's take this into the clipboard. Rename this one. CE chilling element 01. Let's take our heater equipment. F2 clipboard. Control N. Heating element 01. Okay, that's all our user defined pieces of um, device devices for our equipment. Let's drag them into their relevant equipment. So let's put one in the chiller. We've got a chilling element. Heating element belongs to the heater. Case packer motor belongs to case packer equipment. Flow wrapper one, flow wrapper two, flow wrapper three, mixer, flow wrapper one, Two, three. The mixer has two valves. Let's put the mixer valves in the equipment. Now, when we go to our model view, we should see our fully fleshed out model hierarchy. Excellent. So our mixer has got three val uh, two valves and a motor. Our flow wrappers have our ceiling element and motor, one. Each of those is the same. And now we have a chiller element and a heater element. So that's perfect. Let's go back to our deployment view, make sure they're all assigned a host. They should be because they're dragged underneath their particular pieces of equipment. That looks all good. So now we can highlight all of these, deploy them to our application engine, and they should now exist in the Galaxy, and they should exist in the debugging tools as well. should be able to see all of those. That completes making our plant. So we now have a plant. If we were to open up in our model view our mixer, and then go to our object viewer, we should see it has some elements underneath it. So mixer, now we have our motor. Unfortunately, when we look at 
our object. They've got very long names. We don't want to call them this long version of the name. We want to shorten those up just a little bit. Let's go to our derivation view. Uh, sorry, our model view. And we should be able to see... Actually, no, I don't think we can do that. I think they have to have fully unique names. Oh, forgive me. I've led, led you on a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a bum steer. I thought we would be able to give them a shortened version of the name, but because they exist underneath an area, their uniqueness has to remain. So they get longer names than ideal, but that's okay. They've got a level of uniqueness that's adequate for us. We know it's the first motor, but now it's the motor that's on Flowrapper 123, and the equipment is the lowest level in our Wonderware system platform area hierarchy, so that's fine. Okay, let's leave that there for a moment. We're going to go on to looking at things like um, creating some warehousing to store our our process and our work, uh, sorry, our work in process and our raw ingredients and our final product. Uh, conceptually, a production line consumes ingredients from our raw goods warehouse. So in the case of our thing we're making here, say we're making beer, we're going to consume grain and hops and sugars and yeast and things like that in order to make beer. Um, each part of the process is going to, uh, in, the, in our case we have two processes, but in, in a real life operation you would have multiple processes and if you are making something like say biscuits, you might be consuming um, dough to make sheets, uh, a, a bunch of dough from a mixer to make a sheet of dough, and then a sheet of dough might be consumed by the next process which might be cutting the biscuit shape, and then from that process you might move on to squirting jam into the top of the biscuit. That would consume a an unjammed biscuit um, and then produce a jammed but uncooked biscuit, and each part of that cycle takes inventory out of the work in progress warehouse and performs an action on it and then returns it to the work in progress. If you were to imagine this as a, um, as a timeline, it's effectively raw goods warehouse into a process and around to and fro the work in progress stockpile. And then the very final process before shipping a finished good would be moving it to outgoing inventory to a, to a finished goods warehouse. And then from there it would ship to a customer. So you have consumption of raw goods, consumption and production of work in progress, and then the final good is produced too, but can't be consumed with the exception of shipping, which is another whole issue. Let's go on to making ourselves a warehouse model, and we'll do that in just a minute.